hello and welcome everybody in the last session of today in the Builders Track. My name is Tatiana Bellendier and I'm a Principal Security Architect at Dino Track. And today I will be moderating this session. In the next uh, 40, 45 minutes, uh, Rob van der Wea and Spiros Gastaratos will present the understanding the complete chain of application security using OpenCRE.org. Um, after that, we'll have time for questions. Please uh, put your questions in the Q&A panel on the right of the streaming in the Hoover app. Please note that the chat function in Zoom is deactivated uh, for attendees. You can use the chat uh, function in the app without further explanation. I would hand over to Robin Spurs to start and present themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Hello, everybody, and welcome wherever you are in this world. Also on behalf of Spiros, my co-speaker, we're really excited to take you through what Open Siri is exactly and how it can help you. In a nutshell, for those that haven't seen Open Siri yet, it's basically a gigantic index for security requirements across major standards. It links the content of these standards. So when you're checking a thing with ACS, for example, you can learn more about how to test it and how to use tools to test it and how to code solutions for it. And you can learn more about the related threats and read what NIST has to say about it. It brings all this information together around a certain topic that you are working on or interested in. So that's open theory really short. Let's dive into the full story, but maybe first a short introduction. I work for a software improvement group, Rob van der Veer is my name. I specialize in security, privacy and AI, and I take part in all kinds of standardization initiatives national standards, European standards with the NISA, uh, global standards with ISO, IEC, and I contribute to OWASP SAN. Spiros, how about you? Hi, everybody. My name is Spiros Gasteratos. I work as an application security lead at a fintech company based out of London called Thought Machine. I co-lead the OWASP integration standards project, so this OpenCRE.org initiative, and in my Free time, I like to be an open source developer and OWASP volunteer. I've donated code to a bunch of projects, including uh, Dracon, SKF, uh, and others. Thanks very much. So we both lead the integration standards project and we're supported by another co-lead, which is Ali Saad. And the assignment of our project is to bring OWASP standards and beyond more together. And for that purpose, we have created two main things. Uh, first, the security wayfinder that I'll show you in a moment. And also the topic of today, Open CRE, as a linking platform for OWASP and to the rest of the world of security resources. And CRE stands for Common Requirement Enumeration. As said, we build the security wayfinder it's an interactive map of key OWASP projects grouped by the activities in the software development lifecycle. So depending on what you're doing, what you're interested in, you can find resources at OWASP that matter and easily see what they are for. It helps people to get to the right information when they are not so familiar with OWASP or when they are familiar with OWASP because I've been around with OWASP for a while, and so has Spiros, and we're still sometimes confused where, where, where we can find things, and this is really helpful. Uh, it's all based on an idea that started about six years ago when I was working together with Martin Knobloch, who you probably know, and we both felt it was kind of hard to make sense of all the things taking place at OWASP. So after we built this in our project, we started working on open CRE. Um, and let us start the story of open CRE at the why. So why did we create open CRE? It's because 
the world is having a big problem today when it comes to finding relevant information on application security. It's a struggle, and I'm, I'm sure you recognize this. The available information is bulky, fragmented, complex, confusing. Take a look, for example, at this report that I show here in the slide. It's a report by uh, the uh, European Cybersecurity Organization. And it's just a list of existing security standards. Uh, it's more than 200 pages. I think that's a good illustration of the situation. And this is the case, not because it's necessary to have a lot of standards and complexity. Uh, it's not required at all. But there are historic reasons, psychological reasons, political and commercial reasons that we have to deal with this today. So if you're an engineer, a tester, a security officer, if you want to buy software and set requirements, it's hard to select and find appropriate information on security to do your work. And if you're writing a standard, it's hard to refer your readers to other sources because it's a bit of a mess. There are many, many standards, and for most part, they talk about the same things. And this is also the conclusion from an ANISA report on software security. Um, one of the recommendations of this report is to develop a common repository for requirements. And this is exactly what we did in our integration standards project. And it's been my personal quest for about seven years now to, to make a difference for this situation to, uh, to improve. And the CRE is a, is a key initiative for it. So let's start with an example of this struggle. Um, let's take the use case of uh, your writing is standard. You're an author. Uh, how difficult is it to link to related work in an effective way and keep it up to date? Let's have a look. So say you're writing a document for a national standard for some industry. Um, it can also be a company wiki uh, where you're writing a, uh, a policy or uh, more explanation for your developers or your testers. And you're currently dealing with a chapter on secret management. You write something down. Uh, you want to refer your readers to more information because you don't want to cover everything about secrets yourself. You don't have all the knowledge and you can't keep up to date what you write. So it's smart to refer. So you add references and we see this a lot, right? In security resources and it's, it's a good thing because you don't want to write everything yourself. You want to point people to other standards. Um, however, this has several issues and I'm sure you must have experienced all of them or some of them. First of all, such a list lacks structure. It's just a flat list. It's not clear uh, why CWE123 or CWE456 is in this list. Um, second, links get outdated all the time. I, I know many current security standards of which half of the links are not working anymore. Standards change the structure, uh, sometimes their location, and then you get an error message. Or you get linked to an old version while there is a newer version on another location. It's quite hard to keep it up to date. And also uh, there may be some really good resources that the author doesn't know of or chooses not to include because it is limited to some scope. For example, just for AWS or just for Java. And the author doesn't want to create and maintain a very long list. So these lists are rather, uh, are hardly ever uh, complete. So either you get a list of references that is flawed, or what often happens is that authors think, hmm, I really want to help my readers. And I took a look at those links, and I think I can summarize what's written in them. So the standard becomes bigger because the author decides to cover the referred information themselves. Oh dear, yes, the reference problem is solved, but this typically results in inconsistencies and incompleteness because it's not the author's expertise per se, and the information that's written down, that's a certain moment in time. It's not updated automatically. 
in that sense, it's better to refer. Um, and this, this phenomenon is very understandable. Uh, and it's also one of the causes for the bulkiness, the fragmentation and the quality issues that standards face today. If only those references would be more complete, have structure and stay up to date automatically, if only. Well, that's what open theory is for. That's the whole idea. How does open theory solve these problems? How can you use it? Let's look at an example. So in the top left, you see the documentation of the wrong secrets projects, which is a great tool, great resource by Jeroen Willemse and, and others. It's about secret management. <clears throat> well, in this documentation, they want to point their readers to more information on the subject. And typically, you go through what I just showed you and make a list of all these resources that are related. But the idea is that instead of having all these links, you have one link. You have a link to the OpenCRE. You simply link to the OpenCRE page on storing secrets, which is a common requirement. And that page helps you to find everything you need and everything will be up to date. How we do that, I will explain later. But what you see from the page is a link to what NIST writes about uh, cryptographic key establishment. Uh, you will see uh, the OS cheat sheet on secrets management. Uh, you will see links to ASVS, the top 10, uh, the KPEC threats, uh, weaknesses from MITRE, uh, proactive controls, another great OS project, uh, ZEP rules, which are rules of a dynamic testing tool that can detect weaknesses and you learn how you can use these rules to find weaknesses related to secret storage in this case. Everything is nice and connected. And if you want, you as a user of OpenCRE, you can explore related topics because secret storage also links to other common requirements um, that are related. So you can jump to there, for example, the common requirement of storing keys safely and find everything that has to do with that certain topic. And also this whole ecosystem features backlinks. So not just links from one to the other side, but also links back. Um, for example, if somebody is reading the cheat sheet secret management and they follow the link to OpenCRE, they may be very well interested in the wrong secrets project, right? That way everything is connected and you can find all relevant resources from all relevant resources. So there you have it, open CRE, and we build it. It's operational, it's in beta right now, it's open source, it works. Uh, but to make it work, we first had to overcome a number of hardships, uh, I have to say. And we needed to battle a couple of demons. Uh, let me take you along our odyssey of the last, oh, Spears, I think two and a half years. It's, uh, it's been a ride. We first started mapping everything to everything. Now you see here four standards, but at certain point in time we have we had a lot more. So if you have, for example, 10 standards, you need to manually link each section of each standard to the corresponding section in each of the other standards. This is an exponential problem. So it takes a lot of time. And when you're finally done, it will already be outdated. So if you want to map everything to everything, it's too much work and you can't keep up. And all over the internet, there are great endeavors of people trying this, uh, but it's, it's, it's very hard to make this future proof. So what did we do? We solved this by introducing common requirements. These are general security topics and the standards can link to those instead of to each other. So if two sections link to the same topic, they also link to each other because they just specified that they are related. Uh, to zoom into this a little bit more, um, let's say we're talking about session token generation. 
NIST has uh, a nice piece on uh, random uh, number generation. The testing guide talks about how to test it. KPEG describes the threat involved. Uh, mobile ACS uh, talks also about uh, session token generation. What you do is from this mobile ASVS section, you link to session token common requirements. That's the only thing you need to do. And all the other resources that also link to this common requirement, you got within reach, you're linked with those as well. If you maintain the links with the common requirements, it works. So you only have to create the link to the topic not the link to each of every subsection of each and every other standard. So we solved this problem, but we created a new one because we created all those topics, but we ran into another problem. There are many, many topics, uh, very detailed ones also. So if you're writing a standard on storing secrets, you would have to go through all the topics at OpenCRE and find everything related to secret management. Um, it's hard, it's a lot of work, it's error prone. So what we did instead of just having these detailed topics on these detailed technical level, we introduced higher level topics, for example, input validation or authentication on multiple levels. Here you see just a few of them, but we created uh, a semantic web, if you will, of, of things that matter in uh, application security. So if you're writing a piece on storing secrets, you just have to link to the topic of secret storage, and then you're done. Because from there, you can move to everything that is related. And because we built this semantic web of security topic, um, we uh, introduced a nice bonus because users can follow the links between the topics to navigate and to explore information up the tree and down the tree. And we build this web by doing a lot of research, uh, having a lot of workshops, by using existing works on harmonizing standards. For example, the security model by Software Improvement Group that they donated to be used as input to the framework. And this semantic web uh, works like this. Um, you see here different topics within open theory that we also call the common requirements. And linked with them are several standards. I, I just picked, picked out a few just to illustrate the much more standards linked. But let's start with this detailed uh, topic, encrypting personal data at rest. It has an ACS entry that talks more about checking this. It has a link to another topic, personal data handling, uh, which is linked again to some nice, nice NIST uh, documents on personal data and how to deal with it. Through securely storing regulated data, you get to encrypting data at rest and you see connected witnesses and you arrive at cryptography uh, about which NIST also has written a couple of nice chapters as part of uh, uh, SP853 in this case. So everything is connected. And when you look at the topic page of encrypting personal data at rest, you will see all this information because it's directly related and it's indirectly related. And also you will see the topics in between. So it will not be a long list of references it will be clear to you why there's this chapter from this because it's about cryptography and why there's this chapter from this because it's about personal data handling. This is why the topic structure is helpful for exploration, for visualization, uh, and for making the, the linking feasible. Um, we ran into another problem, of course. Uh, after linking to a standard, the standard changed the structure and the links were broken. It became clear to us that you can't keep up with these links, uh, not if you have the ambition to you know, work with so many standards, but even if you have the ambition to work with four standards, it's a lot of work to keep it up to date. 
standards constantly change and rightfully so. So links break at some point. And we found a solution for this. And by doing so, we made OpenSeri self-maintaining. If a standard contains a link, let's say this mobile ACS entry here, and it has this link to this uh, common requirement at OpenSeri, as you may notice, they are identified by six digits separated by a dash. And um, if the standard contains this link, and it's in machine readable source, which it mostly is an MND file or a text file. Um, our parsers can scan that standard. And when it finds the link, it sees, okay, this is a section of this standard with this name, with this number, and it links to this topic. So by parsing the source that just has the link, you have all the information for the mapping there. So the mapping is not maintained in some separate text file, table, or sheet. It is maintained in the standard itself and automatically moves around with the standard. The editor sees the link, and when it takes out that section and puts it in another chapter or whatever, the links move with it and therefore will stay up to date after the next parse. Obviously, this requires the standard to add links to OpenSeri in their material. And for standards that don't have this, you need a mapping file for which we have a certain format. And we put that mapping file, those mapping files on GitHub uh, to which people can contribute. That's the whole idea. So by solving these problems, we were able to create OpenSeri. And the beta went live last September at the 20th anniversary of OWASP. We did this with a lot of help with special kudos to the SKF team, OSSF, input from the OWASP top 10 team. Many people were involved and we now currently map ASVS top 10, NIST 63B, uh, NIST 53, those are the SP800 series, proactive controls, uh, OWASP cheat sheets, OWASP testing guide, MITRE's CWE uh, ZAP, the rules from ZEP are also included, and KPEC describing the threats that are involved. And I would say that now would be probably a good time to do a demo. So I'd like to ask Spiros to take over and share his screen. And if I'm right, you can overrule my sharing, otherwise I'll stop sharing. There is your on mute. You're still on mute. No, you're not on mute. I can't hear you. <laughs> ah, technology. Can you hear me now? Yes. Woo. So sometimes technology needs a kicking. Uh, let me share my screen so that you can see what I am seeing. So for demo, we will have prepared a couple of very useful use cases, uh, at least useful to us, uh, how we've used us, we've used them in their day, our day to day. And we believe they're gonna be useful to you as well. Let's uh, share a part of the screen. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Here. Awesome. So use case number one is tooling. Uh, I'm an AppSec engineer. Uh, I believe some of you in the audience are also AppSec engineers or DevSecOps or however we call running tools, scanning code and advising on security uh, these days. So we have here a report from a very popular um, scanning tool called OWASP uh, ZAP. And OWASP ZAP reports as many tooling reports um, contain alerts, an example alert uh, I put in here is LDAP injection. And for every alert, ZAP and every tool out there needs to provide you some references. Because if they don't, they end up in this position that Rob mentioned, where you have to just copy paste text from all over the place, which will quickly become unwieldy. 
However, you also have very limited space for references. You cannot add all the references. You cannot also maintain a huge list of references. Zap itself uh, has um, four ref three references plus one I added for Siari. And it's already kind of a long report. So on the other hand, what they can do and they will soon be doing uh, PR incoming is link to opencre.org. Uh, if I click this link, it takes you to opencre.org. The specific CRE that describes LDAP injection and how to protect it uh, against it. With as an application security professional, once I have this information, I can easily disseminate specific standards and specific links to specific teams or stakeholders so that I don't need to rewrite it myself. So I save myself time and I can be lazy. And so that we all know what we're talking about. And as a last, uh, like, as a last point, different levels and different positions and stakeholders need different kinds of information. So in this case, I can send my auditors uh, a link to ASBS. I can send uh, architects or other people uh, a link to practical controls. I can tell my boss that we have um, a vulnerability related to CWV-19. And I can send the developers who found it, uh, who are the custodians of that specific piece of code, a link to those cheat sheets on how to fix it. So for SVS, one click, and you get exactly what controls are um, broken. For proactive controls, another click, and you get exactly what other proactive controls um, you need to do. CWG, similar. You have all the CWG information. And cheat sheets, I think you know the drill so far. Uh, you get exactly how to fix it, specific special char characters you need to escape, and several cheat sheets also include small pieces of information uh, or code so that you don't have to, um, yeah, so that you don't have to do anything about it. And all of this, because we created a web application and web applications contain APIs, uh, can be done via our API. So you don't even need to uh, visit a website. You can include this into your own automation. And this way, because we know about the ZAP specific rule, you can query uh, our API for that rule, find out, um, get the JSON, find out the um, links, uh, the document, and then you have the CRE I showed on the first uh, slide. And then you can manipulate that CRE to extract all the relevant information. So by doing all of that, you have easy and immediate dissemination of information to all relevant stakeholders without any, um, without much effort from your side. You don't need to rewrite or copy paste from mediation advice from any wiki. It's all easy. However, what happens if you have an internal security standard as well, many places do. I know the place I work and the, our customers do as well. Well, in that case, you can use CRE as well and you can import your standard into CRE and it's very easy. Uh, I took the liberty of creating an ACMA security standard uh, for you, for those of you who have ever watched Looney Tunes, uh, ACMA is the company that uh, provides Coyote with all sorts of cartoonish weapons. Um, and um, the ACMA security standard has a few clauses uh, that somehow map either to ASVS or even easier to CRE. Uh, you don't have to map it to both. You can just map it to anything we already know about, and then we will um, do this uh, like jump mappings for you. 
And as you see, this is quite an easy templated uh, spreadsheet. We, for now, we only support uh, Google Sheets, but if we see that there is any need for other technologies uh, for importing, we can also figure this out. And the way to make to import this, for now it's terminal, soon it will be web application. And you just write cre.py, add from spreadsheet, and then the link to the spreadsheet. And if I press enter, and the demo gods agree with me today, these will be imported. Perfect. It complains about KPEG, but that is information. It's fine. And now I can go to my local version and I can load my local version of CRE. Type the name of my company or anything related to the standards I'm looking for. And as you see, my controls are already there. And if I open a random one, say authorized access, I links to the ASVS you it was linked to. And if I and as you see, uh, they are all linked to the ASVS that they were linked to. And this one, because it the specific CRE had other links, also links to ZAP, cheat sheets, testing guide, CWE. And if I scroll the way down here, it also links to NIST. So you, as an auditor or um, a security professional, wrote a short spreadsheet, which is one mapping, and you get every other mapping we have and we know about for free. I think that allows quite a lot of flexibility and quite a lot of uh, saving of time. Rob, back to you. Thanks, Pyrrhus. So after this demo, I'd like to do a short recap of why we're doing this, because it's, it's very important to get this across. The CRE enables alignment and cross-reference between security material, material. And by doing so, it becomes easier for standard makers. And it's easier for people who work with security to find and use relevant information. And there are two important bonuses. First of all, the common requirements they help lead to a shared understanding on what security means. It helps to speak the same language, so to say. It will be easier for people in procurement to mention a certain requirement and people at the other side of the table will recognize that requirement because it's a topic that, on which there is consensus and in which everything is bound together. It also leads to more consistency and, and, and less gaps between standards because there's less duplication and, and less uh, proliferation. So link all the things with open CRE. Final slide, a call to action. We will continue to work with standard makers to further adopt open CRE. And we're constantly adding new standards and new features. Something that we recently built is that you can use OpenCRE to deep link to a certain resource. So people won't see OpenCRE's user interface when, they, when you use this URL, uh, but the CRE system will make sure that the right section of the right version of, for example, the ASVS will be shown. So this way you can have maintainable links to a specific resource uh, linked from your work. And also using the same idea, you can use the URL to specify how you want the referred information to be displayed. Uh, perhaps only OWASP resources or perhaps resources only about processes or only about uh, software development. Uh, in the references, 
in the URL, you can specify the scope of things uh, to, be, uh, to be shown. Another cool version is personal profiles. The idea is, and we're working on that, uh, you can specify what you find interesting at OpenSeri and what resources you prefer or which ones you don't want to see. So whenever you click on a reference link uh, anywhere, you will only see links to the resources that matter the most to you. So our idea is there's a lot out there. Let's enable people to find this lot, but provide everything that we can to tailor, to actually create an information filter depending on the person that's using it. And that allows you that from your work, you can point to all those topics and the end user will be in control of what is interesting and what is not because everybody has his or her own scope and interest. Um, another cool idea is that we're working on is to have federated search, the ability to enter a search term and look through all the material that is being linked to. You can now search um, at the OpenCV website and you can search in the descriptions of the requirements. It's quite useful. If you search for a session, for example, you will find everything about sessions. But currently you cannot search into the actual detailed content uh, because it's not part of our database. But because we parse the machine readable sources of standards, we can also create an index and then provide you with text search on all the content of the standards and integrate that into OpenCRE. That's what we're working on. What can you do? Well, you will be seeing OpenCRE more and more as part of tools and, and standard documents to point you in the right direction. But you can also use it. You can go to the website to look up things and learn more about a certain topic. And I invite you, we invite you to do that and preferably let other people know about it. Tweet about it, uh, link in about it, whatever, make nice selfies with OpenCRE, whatever you can do to help us spread the word that this thing is out there. Provide your feedback and ideas, very important for us. We have a GitHub project for it. It's linked here. Uh, you can join our mailing list uh, and you can join our team to help grow OpenCRE further. And above all, a call to all standard makers. And the call is let's unite. Start adding Siri links to your work and ask us to parse it and then you're done. Uh, it saves you time on finding references and keeping them uh, up to date. Uh, links will never break. Your standard becomes instantly findable through OpenCRE. You provide viewers access to a larger range of related resources. So you won't need to discuss all these topics yourself. And if you're really interested, uh, you're welcome to join our stakeholder group to help steer the CRE direction if you're a standard maker. And yeah. That's all. Thank you very much for, for listening and uh, let's make security better together. Thank you very much, Robin Spurs, for this exciting presentation. Hmm. Thank you for making it so, you know, with your passion, you're making it so interesting to listen to. Uh, there is a, at least one question in the Q&A for you. Um, OpenCV topics require adoption and incorporation into standards. How are you getting on with this task? Are you in communication with what is such NIST and ESA ISO to have those incorporated? Yes, th this is, this is uh, of course, our, our biggest challenge. We had a number of technical challenges and we solved those. And it's, a, it's, of course, a chicken and egg situation because when you have nothing and you approach a standard and uh, you want the cooperation, it won't work. So our strategy is let's build, uh, connect a number of standards and focus on, uh, on OWASP. So it's instantly uh, useful and then approach the various standards to let's get on board and demonstrate uh, how cool it is and how helpful it is. And this, this presentation is part of this um, a promotion tour, you could call it, uh, that's necessary to show what you can do with it, to demonstrate what you can do with it, and to uh, get these standards on board. Our strategy has been to first work uh, within OWASP 
and well, you've seen the standards that have been uh, have been adopted. We're working, for example, with the great guys from ASVS to see how we can get uh, links, machine readable links in their resources. So it's also uh, self-maintainable. Uh, we're working with uh, Zap, for example. So we're working together with these standards um, that uh, we want to uh, adopt first at OWASP. And when we have this working, I think we have a great case to approach uh, the nice people from, uh, from NIST. And I intend to approach uh, Anissa as well and MITRE uh, to see how we can, uh, how we can collaborate. And we want to make this as open as possible, which is why the stakeholder group is, is so important and which uh, is why we position it, uh, well, as an OWASP initiative, but open outside of uh, OWASP. I think that's the only way to get uh, uh, adoption uh, from, uh, from standards outside of OWASP. Does that make sense? Anything to add, Spiros? No, that's pretty spot on. Uh, one thing, one small thing, I guess, uh, if you have contacts with any other standards makers, or if by any chance you are a standards maker, let's talk, we don't bite, and let's make this happen. You don't have to do much or if anything, and you gain so much uh, in return. Maybe to add a little thing to that. So psychologically, it's of course, uh, for a standard maker who is used to control these mappings, uh, him or herself, it's uh, a step. A step where you say, okay, so we're going to rely on open theory to uh, for, make it easier for us uh, and to find a lot of uh, a lot more resources than we currently do, and everything will will stay up to date. But it's important um, uh, to to realize that this is a psychological step where you put the control of these mappings into the hands of Open Siri. And this is why uh, uh, it's very important to have this conversation with these standards makers, and of course they also always remain involved as it is an open source project and you can add issues, uh, you can uh, alter links, you can create pull requests, et cetera. It's, it's a community effort. Okay, I hope this answers the question. I have another one. Do we have a kind of a roadmap? What kind of standards are the next one on the run? The, the classical one being something like PCI or all financial regulation stuff, PCI being a big one in uh, North America, but there are others in Europe as well. Yes, uh, PCI uh, is high on the list, but talking about OWASP, uh, SKF content also, uh, the MACS is interesting. Uh, that's that's a short list, uh, that's a short list for now. Okay, so there is some planning happening and it comes as it comes, right? Indeed. Okay. It also depends, of course, on the roadmap of a certain standard. Standards have their own cyclus where they working on a new version, and it's it's it, it's some points in time. It's not a good point uh, to to collaborate. So it also depends on uh, when it's convenient for these standards makers to engage. That makes sense. Just out of the curiosity, do the CRE numbers have a meaning? Well, Spiros? Uh, the meaning is that they are random and <laughs> they are um, three random digits, uh, a dozen, three other random digits. We thought about adding some sort of structure, but in our experience, when we've seen this kind of structure before, uh, it didn't really provide much uh, benefit and it was too much trouble for the little benefit it provided. We would also have to start reserving ranges of CREs for future use, but security changes quite often with new attacks and new requirements uh, coming all over all the time. So it would be quite hard uh, and quite distracting from our core mission to link uh, standards together. Okay. Uh, here, 
obviously not coming with a new standard. You are coming with a logical structure to organize things based on some kind of consents, right? Which means there are different opinions on the topic. How do you deal with these different opinions? Yeah, good point. So indeed, the topic structure, it's something that we introduce, but it's also the result from everything that is out there. When you look at these standards, uh, they may be perceived very differently. When, when, when you look closely, they're, they're very similar. There is consensus about certain things, but there's also differences in tastes, uh, at least. Well, first of all, it's great that uh, our topic structure is not a tree, but a web. Let me explain. If you're building uh, uh, a tree structure, and then you're basically writing sort of a, a chapter and section and subsection structure, it is, you can have big debates on whether you put um, uh, preventing log injection into the input validation chapter or into the logging and error handling chapter. Big debates, um, big fights. Um, but the nice thing is that if you have a semantic web, you can have both. So that solves part of this problem. Still, things remain um, to a certain level opinionated. For example, we have a topic structure at a high level that's called logging and error handling. And there may be people that say, I would never put those two in the same topic. Well, we, we split after logging and error handling, but we have a combined topic because they're so, well, so intertwined. Um, this can be a matter of uh, maybe even sort of religious debates, uh, but they don't have really much sense. It's nice to have them, but you need to step over them and then decide, okay, if we're not going to decide on a structure, it will never be possible to link everything together. So we have to find each other. And thankfully, uh, we have a semantic web instead of a semantic tree. And we have a structure that's open source. So we can talk about this, right? Uh, we can have discussions and then uh, do a suggestion to change the structure uh, if, uh, if things change over time, for example. It totally makes sense. Um, maybe the last one, uh, you mentioned already the standards linking to you. You also mentioned ISS. For that, does ISS already uh, reference to CRE? Uh, Spiros is working on that with uh, ISS. What's the latest status? So that's a, a great question. So. Uh, ASVS is releasing a new version sometime next year, and we are working hard with them to find uh, how we could integrate completely. For now, there is a pull request open towards the ASVS repository, adding links as a uh, markdown table between ASVS and CRE. And this allows ASVS to link to CRE very easily and without adding links to their uh, existing text. Um, the great folks over at ASBS are very nice to work with. So I believe we will manage to be in ASBS version five next year. That sounds like a great plan. I'm really looking forward to the exploring what you've done so far because I think truly believe this will make our whole lives so much easier on finding the right things at the right moment. And with that, I would really like to thank you for your work and for the presentation today and wish you all the best for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sachan and everybody. Thanks for your time. <laughs>